This is in 1862. Lincoln said, they wish to get rid of me, and I am sometimes half disposed to gratify them. We are now on the brink of destruction. It appears to me the Almighty is against us, and I can hardly see a ray of hope. If I had not come as the CEO of the campaign, Trump would not have won. And that's a fact. Some of the people you're doing business with here in Europe are connected to neo-fascism. Energizing hate, hate black people, hate Muslims is not right. Those are scenes from a fascinating new Fly on the Wall documentary, due to be released later this month, called The Brink. It chronicles the life of political provocateur Steve Bannon since he left the Trump White House in a cloud of controversy in 2017. The arc of Bannon's career is a remarkable one. A one-time Golden Sachs banker and Hollywood movie producer, he took over the right-wing website Breitbart News and used it as a platform for his populist views railing against the Davos elites and the threat of illegal immigration. Since flaming out as Donald Trump's chief strategist, Bannon has embarked on quixotic new ventures, trying to shore up the president's political base in the United States and unite nationalist anti-immigration parties throughout Europe. He's also formed a curious alliance with a fugitive Chinese billionaire seeking to expose the corruption of that country's Communist Party elites. We'll talk to the two women who made The Brink, one of whom used to work for Bannon, and we'll discuss the fallout from Paul Manafort's sentencing, as well as the latest entry into the very crowded Democratic presidential field on this episode of Skullduggery. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true. But the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. There will be no lies. We will honor the American people with the truth and nothing else. I'm Michael Isakov, Chief Investigative Correspondent for Yahoo News. And I'm Dan Clydman, Editor-in-Chief of Yahoo News. So, you know, I attended the screening, an advanced screening of uh, this movie, The Brink, about Steve Bannon uh, the other night uh, in Washington. And um, I got to say, uh, it was a really, uh, it, it's really a gripping movie. Uh, you know, I and a hundred other Washington reporters, political investigative reporters, uh, have uh, spent some time with Bannon. You usually get him for interviews, uh, one-shot deals, and you text with him, um, and then he disappears. But to be able to see him in all his full glory and see all the people surrounding him and who he's dealing with uh, is quite an eye-opener. Yeah, this is kind of Bannon unplugged, um, and uh, he is a kind of a electric uh, personality and, and character. You know, he's got enormous charisma, larger than life. Um, but you just kind of wonder uh, the whole time you're watching this movie, like what are his motives really? Is he a, can, is he someone who's got real convictions or is he an uh, opportunist? And I think the filmmakers who we'll be talking to do a brilliant job um, of, of just sort of being fairly neutral and letting him, you know, depending on your view, but some would say hang himself with his own words. I w- one just uh, disclosure, uh, the movie was produced by Riot, uh, which is a film company, <laughs> which is a riot, which is a their terrific, right? They, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> right. but they, <laughs> yeah. it's a film company uh, that is owned by our parent company, uh, Verizon Media. So just uh, for transparency. So are sake. you suggesting we're promoting a corporate product here on Skullduggery? I'm is suggesting that, right? that yeah. this is the <laughs> ethical thing to do, right. and I don't want to be whacked by some damn press critic. Yeah. All right. Well, listen. For the record, I had no idea about the riot role in. <laughs> Until uh, actually, until I saw the movie, but well, yeah, that's right, not right. why we chose to do. Uh, all right, highlight moving it. on, Isakov. Yeah, all right. A lot, of, a lot of uh, 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 important news this week. I, I was there also in the courtroom the other day. Paul Manafort getting sentenced. To see him uh, in that wheelchair, try to be apologetic and try to show contrition um, was, uh, I have to say, not the greatest acting job I've seen. Uh, um, you know, he was he read this uh, prepared uh 
uh, remarks to the judge, uh, rather stiffly, I thought. Probably uh, doesn't help uh, your yeah. case when you're in a wheelchair, probably because you've got gout from living <laughs> uh, high on the hog yeah. for, you know, all these years. Uh, right. And, um, you know, uh, he got reamed out. It, it, this is his second sentencing. He was sentenced, uh, you know, the week before in Alexandria and was criticized for not saying, I'm sorry for what I did. He talked about how painful it was that he's been now twice convicted of uh, multiple federal felonies and is going to be spent and is going to spend, as we now know, seven and a half years in federal prison, unless Donald Trump pardons him. Um, But um, uh, so he made an effort to say, I'm sorry uh, for what I did uh, to Judge Amy uh, uh, Berman Berman Jackson. Jackson And she was really having none out of it. She saw none of it. She saw right through him uh, and said uh, she didn't think that his uh, apologia was all that sincere and um, uh, pointed out that his crimes were quite serious, Uh, you know, ripping off the U.S. Treasury for millions of dollars using offshore accounts and uh, running this, uh, you know, illegal lobbying operation on behalf of the corrupt Yanukovych government in Kiev uh, without uh, well, disclosing yeah. it to the well, Justice so, Department. Amy, one of Amy Judge uh, Berman Jackson's points was, you know, the, the Manafort defense, they kept saying, well, there's no evidence of collusion here. This has nothing to do with Russia. And she said, well, that's a red herring that, you know, right. these are serious felonies, multiple felonies. And uh, the right. fact that they are they don't go directly to collusion are, uh, you know, are ir- ir- irrelevant. But it does raise, I think, an interesting and important point at this particular moment, which is this is, you know, this is the end of the road for. Uh, Manafort, except there is, uh, he mm-hmm. faced on that same day indictments from the from um, New York State. New York State, but yeah. it, but but does this suggest the sort of denouement or the grand finale of Mueller in terms of the Russia investigation? And I will note just very quickly at the same time, the same week, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, s- basically said, "We're not going to impeach Trump." Um, that uh, there's unless just- there's powerful new evidence that Mueller brings forward, I think it's a sign that uh, uh, Pelosi and other Democratic leaders have lowered their expectations about what we're going to hear from Robert Mueller. There's really no way of knowing the answer to that. But if you you know put all the cases together, Manafort, Flynn. Cohen, it looks like they've come to the end of their rope. Now, Cohen is still throwing stuff up uh, out there about uh, possible dangling of pardons by people connected to um, uh, lawyers connected to Trump. Uh, We'll see how that plays out. Um, But, um, you know, uh, whether uh, uh, Mueller is going to live up to what you know, a lot of people hoped he was going to uh, deliver uh, remains to be seen. Um, we're still, you know, we've been waiting any week now for uh, the Mueller report or the announcement that the Mueller investigation is over. Um, uh, you know, the TikTok continues and we shall see. One interesting note, of course, is it was Manafort had been the campaign chairman. He was fired by Trump and then replaced by Steve Bannon, the subject of uh, the film we're going to be talking about with the makers of the film. Well, let's get to it. We now have with us uh, Allison Clayman and Marie Therese Girgis, um, the two women who made The Brink. Um, congratulations on what is a really amazing documentary. Thank you so much. Um, And, you know, so much to uh, unpack in this film. Uh, But I just want to start out with how this began. Where was the germ of an idea for doing a movie about Steve Bannon after he leaves the White House? Um, And how did you get the amazing access that you have to him? Well, I'll just start out by saying the and this is this Marie, Marie Therese, Therese yeah, yeah, the okay. uh, the producer. <laughs> we didn't start out to make it after he left the White House. That was <laughs> that just happened. Um, but uh, he actually had agreed to 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 do the film when he was still in the White House, which would have been very interesting. 
but uh, it probably could have been pulled <laughs> off given what we've learned we about have, the White House, right? We, someone right. could have been walking around with a camera the whole time. And, and we would have seen a lot more of President Trump yes, in the film. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, so I worked for Steve Bannon many years ago. He put together a small group of people who bought an art house film distribution company that I was working at. So he became my boss for about three years and uh, my direct boss. I worked very, very closely with him. And uh, what was that like? You know, the truth is it was the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, you know, what you see in the film of his temper was probably worse back then because, you know, this is 15 years ago. He was younger. He had a little more energy. So he had a very, very, very um, explosive temper. He was very demanding. He was, um, you know, almost militaristic in some ways. Like, I think he, you know, he definitely uh, has been influenced greatly by his time in in the military, in the Navy, you know, very, a lot of rules, a lot of, you know, call me at zero, zero, eight hundred, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was, he was terrifying in many ways. And a lot of people that I worked with really disliked him. But um, for me, you know, he was extremely supportive of the work that we were doing. Believe it or not, he was a huge fan of kind of art house film. We were releasing a lot of really prestigious and often kind of controversial foreign language films, independent films, documentaries. And he was a champion. And so for me as a young woman to have somebody come in and say, I believe in you. And, you know, he promoted me to run a company basically when I was, you know, 31 um, and he supported us, you know, he gave us the money to do what we wanted to do. And so, you know, th it was a really a mixed bag, but, uh, he, ha he was a, he was a good sort of force in my life as a young person, I would say. And all so, around. and so in the, the second part of Mike's question was how you got that access. He trusted you, Yeah. but there's more to it, isn't there? I mean, this, he, he calls himself a propagandist. Yeah. Um, he thinks that's a, a good word. Um, and, uh, he likes these platforms, right? He, he wants to get his message out. Well, I asked, so I, so I asked him about, you know, actually I started contacting him again. I was, I lost contact with him for years, partially intentionally, partially just life, even though we had been pretty close for a few years after I stopped working for him. And, um, I started reaching out to him when he joined Trump, the campaign, just to kind of honestly tell him, I can't believe you're doing this and I'm disgusted and <laughs> really send him very vicious emails and text messages which he actually always responded to pretty politely. And uh, and then at some point, I just kind of really woke up one day. I produce documentaries. I work in film and thought, you know, I can make a documentary about him. And I think we'll learn because of the way I know him, I think because of the trust he has in me, I think he would allow me to kind of have somebody with him for an extended period of time the way he wouldn't allow someone else, which I do think is the truth. Um, and he would know that I would make something that would be very prestigious and high end, which he actually is very attracted to. And um, and we could sort of shed some light on this person who I think I thought and, and still think was being um, represented in a very limited way in, in the media and entertainment media and the press. And uh, so I asked him. He was still in the White House. I think it was April. He uh, said no several times, said, you're going to destroy me. You'll ruin me because he knew. Well, he says that in the film yeah. at one. Well, he knew I'm how I get, felt. He says I'm going to get crushed in this film exactly. at one point. Right. But then I, I don't, you know, I don't know what changed. But maybe the fourth time he just wrote back and said, "I'll do it." Now, if I had to guess, I would say he, they're probably the, you know, the writing was on the wall in in the White House. It probably wasn't going very well. He probably was already anticipating his future. I think he probably decided at that point he kind of had nothing to lose and maybe something to gain. Um, and then it just evolved as it went on. I mean, Allison, you know, you could talk about what you think about the sort of propaganda aspect. It's definitely something we thought about. I want to ask you sort of what you set out to show about Steve Bannon and what in the end you think you did when the movie was completed. Well, the way uh, Marie Therese is describing how she thought that the um, coverage of him was limited and had holes in it. I mean, she had this fuller but maybe outdated picture in some respects since she wasn't actually close with him over the last 15 years. Um, but uh, I only knew him from, you know, his image in the press. I, but I, I could tell that it was um, that he was someone who clearly loved being seen as very powerful and it's okay if it was an evil power too. I mean, you know, this was something that... Um, it seemed like this limited 
portrait. It wasn't that we needed to fill it out because he needed his humanity on full display to, you know, possibly redeem him. It was because that was giving him more power. It kind of he relished in this yeah, idea he, of him as the, the evil genius. He loves it. He was, you know, I, I would, yeah, he loved every minute of it. He loves it. And um, I think for me uh, personally, the question that I was most motivate I mean it was too when she called me and said I, you know would you like to do this I think there were two primary reasons why I had an immediate yes <laughs> which I think one was it just did seem like an opportunity to be on the front lines uh, to document something that would be both historical um, and urgent for right now and that it would be an opportunity if it really was, you know, my caveat was, well, I need to meet him and see what he's like. And is he really going to give the access we need and the complete creative autonomy from him to do it? Um, but that seemed like an opportunity, um, that I, that I felt like, uh, I know how this can go. I th I thought I could potentially be underestimated and I could maybe turn out something great, but it, you know, again, depending on meeting him. Um, and the second thing is I think for me the the question of what it really is kind of like the banality of evil, the idea that people who do horrible things or, you know, promote, uh, promote hate, you know, put forward policies that are really damaging to a lot of people are just people. And what that is about is something that I think ever growing up, I was completely, you know, obsessed with, uh, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there is a genre of, you know, young adult Holocaust fiction and literature that I, I mean, that's like kind of what I read as a kid. Um, I never really talked to my grandparents in great detail, I think, because I was too scared uh, about their experiences. But I would read all their, the memory book from their town, you know, Holocaust Memorial Day. I went to Jewish day school. It was something that so consumed me. And I think the so, question so, of who the Germans were was so the right. one. So what do you think about when they went out? Well, I, I want to yeah. start out. I mean, the film starts out with Bannon talking about Auschwitz and Birkenau. Um, and... Um, it's really, uh, I mean, it's you know, gripping to hear him talk about it, but what, why did you choose to start, out, start the film out that way? And what was the takeaway you, you had and you think viewers have from hearing him talk about it? He's not admiring no. in any way of the Nazi his, and the Holocaust. No. He's talking about it in a kind of interesting clinical way. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, I couldn't believe when when he goes into this story, which is what ends up opening the film. It's sort of like a cold open. You're sitting with him, and and you know, f formally there were a lot of reasons why I wanted to start with it, and then and thematically as well. It's it is it's a way to like ease you in. First of all, you you know, just sort of you're here with him. For a lot of viewers, that's like already like a big adjustment. You get to feel his presence the way he loves storytelling. Um, so you really get to like have this moment with him when this, and I had lots of moments like that where he would be, you know, telling me stories, tall tales, you know, whatever he thinks, uh, that was a lot of our time. But the fact that he goes into the story about Auschwitz, um, about him visiting Auschwitz and then going into, you know, which I can describe, but uh, you know, he's he's talking about essentially the banality of evil. Right. I mean, he's saying that he was he found visiting Birkenau so chilling. Um, and I guess I'm always scared. I don't want to, like, give away the <laughs> too much of the movie. But, you know, he, he, he what he's talking about is not it's not Holocaust denial. So if you're coming in and you think he's going to be something out, outrageous like that, I mean, it's not. But it's but it's very unsettling because what he is is commenting on is how you know you can see all the planning of the everyday person uh you know in 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 corporations you know in, in companies you know just trying to get the execution of this grand operation which is mass murder which he's not condoning in this story but he's saying you know the the glee that he has when he's thinking about the planning and how you can see it and what it must have been like and he's really talking about he says good people you know good people back at their desks or, ordinary people drinking coffee having meetings planning a structure for mass murder well let me and and so i would just say that you know he i mean he knew not just my politics but he d did know that i was jewish and 
and he knows my family backstory. So I think he knew that saying it to me, and I think on my face. That's why he I, nods. Yeah, when that's he says why he. Out. That's why he nods because I think my eyes grew wide and my eyebrows went up. But for me, it's not just because of the personal connection. It's because for me, that was my. M- that was my why I'm making the film, like why me as a filmmaker and not another filmmaker in this opportunity. And so I was I had chills and was like frozen and just hoping I could keep it in in focus while I kept his eye contact because he was basically giving t- talking to me in in a very odd way, you know, about for me, the one of the major questions that I had in this whole film and, and why I was doing it. So that and I, and I didn't prompt it. It came as you see, well, he's he's he, he gets to that story on his own. Well, yeah. Alex, let me let me ask you this, because one of the um, and, and again, I also want to be sensitive to not give away too much of the, yeah. of the film. <laughs> but one of the ironies is that uh, after that Auschwitz Birkenau scene uh, and throughout the movie, one of the themes as it unfolds is anti-Semitism yeah. um, and anti-Semitic tropes, particularly surrounding uh, George Soros and um, and the, the so-called globalists. Uh, when when you were done making this movie, uh, did you think that uh, Bannon was anti-Semitic? I uh, I mean, I didn't have to wait till I was done because everything I observed showed that he um, he had no concern for the kinds of, you know, anti-Semitic tropes that he was engaging with. He was willing to work with people who um, he was willing to work with people who either also condoned anti-Semitism or, you know, far right parties in Europe that had a history that they hadn't fully, you know, distanced themselves from. Um, And for me, it's all, and I would challenge him on that too. I really was there, you know, when I had the opportunity to say, why would, why are you doing this or why wouldn't you change it? And he's a grown man and he is an, you know, he's an adult and he's smart enough to know what he's doing. Um, And he's, he willfully, you know, takes the positions that he does. Frankly, he looks at being pro-Israel as like his greatest cover for anti-Semitism. That's a shield for him. Yes. And I think, you know, yeah, the idea that, you know, Jews should have a nation all of their own, uh, you know, and be strong nationalists. I mean, that is, that kind of can work with an anti-Semitic worldview too. Well, yes, because let me just make, yeah, Yeah. go ahead. I just want to add that, you know, we get asked this question a lot. Is Bannon a racist? Is Bannon anti-Semitic? You know, is Bannon, and I think that, really what I'll speak for myself but I know Alice and I have talked about it I think that it doesn't the answer really is it doesn't matter what is in his heart we really can't say Allison can't say yeah. I can't say I know him pretty well um I think it's you have to look at someone's actions you have to look at the policies that they you know support that they champion yes that, and that's what I mean at, when I say yeah that, and 100%. I so, so I think that you know I have my own feelings or opinions having known him about maybe what is in his heart or not but it doesn't really matter and that's actually kind of a conclusion I had to reach myself when struggling with you know watching someone I knew very well and actually really liked you know evolve over years into who we know now as Steve Bannon is that it doesn't matter really it matters kind of what you fight for who you stand with who your allies are who your enemies are and that those are the most important things you, you know, don't have I, to have hate in your say, heart to I think be the f- hateful. First, yeah. first time I ever talked to him, I think, was <clears throat> not long after Charlottesville. And, you know, he's very engaging. He's very knowledgeable. You know, he's great for reporters to talk to because there's all sorts of tid- tidbits that he gives you. But then I sort of raised the Charlottesville. And aren't you concerned that, you know, you are riling up uh, a lot of really hateful people? Um, who are flocking to your cause and that that's going to undercut everything you're doing. And he just dismisses it almost as a sort of wave of the hand. Oh, they're just a bunch of nutcases. I don't think about them. I don't, I don't care about them. And what do you think about that? That's my experience And I was sort of like put off by like, really, you don't get it that, you know, this is a, you know, this is a thing. This is real. It's because this he doesn't have a defense. Good. It's and, because he does not have And the only thing I can think defense. of, and I'd be interested in your takeaway, is he is at heart a provocateur. He wants to provoke people. He wants to take things to the edge. Yes, yes. And, and he knows that, you know, delving into, you know, sort of racist, anti-Semitic sentiments is going to anger and infuriate and provoke a lot of people. And, and also, that's what he gets off on. And also attract a lot of people. You know, right. I mean, he is well, a provocateur. Certainly. He's always in a provocateur, which is something that I 
you know, knew and could see. And sometimes I felt the media was taking him very literally when he would say certain things. And I knew that they weren't, he didn't mean them literally. However, um, at the same time, you know, I think that, I think that the notion of being dismissive of those things and saying, oh, you know, we don't invite those people in. I mean, there are some really, you know, pretty, I would say, extreme people who he, you know, not necessarily David Duke, but I mean, I think there are people who he spends time with, who he, who help him, who, you know, are na white nationalists, yes, you know, right. white supremacists. Can, let, so oh. I think that, you know, if you, if you, you cannot not on some level be, you have to be okay with that, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you wake up every day and you're thinking about how do I harm Jews? How do I harm African Americans? I don't know if that's what he's thinking when he wakes up. Also, he is a very opportunistic person. Yeah. He thinks about himself every day. And Let there are other ways that. to provoke too, especially now as he's trying to cast himself as a populist, quote unquote, and economic nationalism. I mean, there's plenty of provocative things you can say if you're saying I'm, I'm about help championing the little guy. I mean, it doesn't add up. It's a choice to choose these lines to provoke. But I want to pick up on this theme because I guess my question is I was watching the movie. C clearly he he you know he relishes his image as an enfant terrible and a you know a grenade thrower. And this whole area of uh, ethno nationalism and you know uh, is uh, is seems like very fertile territory for him. But my question is how much conviction does he have about these issues as opposed to uh, you know, this is a way to provoke people. Um, but the whole issue of, of this kind of populist revolution and globalism, does he, do you, did you get the sense that he really believes in it? No. Really? Yeah. yeah. And that goes to the opportunism. Because that, I, that think I think the opportunism raised. leads it all because again, it just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. I mean, if, when you, when push comes to shove, when I ask him about what, the world should look like if he gets his way or what policies does he want to put forth he doesn't have answers beyond things like walls and things like stopping immigration that is really where the you know the th that's as far as their policy thinking has really has really worked out all the uh, and all the other stuff he's meeting with millionaires and billionaires to talk about, oh, I just learned about the housing crisis. There's a housing <laughs> crisis for millennials. Oh, my God. I wish there was a way I could have fit that in the film because yeah. I used to, you know, uh -oh. joke with him when he would tell me that. I was like, oh, really? So what are you going to do for me about that? I mean, like he doesn't have policies for most of these he things. He seems to relish the fight and being in the arena more than he does. I think you have to really look at who who his who is supporting him and who and who he's carrying water for. And I think all the rest is rhetoric. Well, let's talk about that because one of the, the there's two major sort of things he's doing in this film. One is political for the 2018 election. He's trying to shore up tr uh, Trump's political base. Um, uh, even before that, you have him going down to Alabama, uh, you know, campaigning for Roy Moore, uh, a true crackpot. Uh, and then he's also in Europe. You're all over Europe with him where he's meeting with all these right-wing nationalist uh, leaders to try to form some sort of grand union of, you know, nationalist uh, anti-immigration groups. What, first of all, did he have any success in that at all? I mean, he's, he's, he's taking all these meetings. Did it lead to anything? The, the, what he says he's setting out to do in terms of having, uh, you know, there is an organization that this guy, Michael Madrickaman, uh, who's the leader of a very, very marginal, extreme uh, far-right party in Belgium, um, you know, he, he created a nonprofit that is called The Movement, and, you know, Bannon was going to be invited to be in as part of it, and they were going to provide data analytics and polling and try to help all these parties in various countries in the EU win enough of a majority in the 2019 upcoming May EU parliamentary elections that they would have in their ideal world a, you know, a ruling minority, you know, that they would have, you know, a third plus one and they could, you know, kind of Tea Party style wreak havoc um, for Bannon with the ultimate goal of trying to take apart the EU. I don't know if every single party is interested in that, but at the meetings I filmed, they did. Ex some of them did express that um, as an idea. Um, that organization hasn't done anything it said it's going to do. He, he did meet with many le world I mean, leaders. Can I add one thing? Uh, and and um, I think he 
put this idea in their heads. I mean, he didn't originate this idea either of kind of this coordination, but, you know, would they have all sat down at a table yeah, and had these, had these meetings and following up even without him? I think that that's something that's did, important. Did any of that, that help their electoral I, chances? I, we don't know yet. Other, I mean, they're probably going to win seats. And I mean, at the, yeah. the yeah. end of the day, they're going to, far right parties are going to win seats and, and he's going to take the credit it's, for yeah, it. Right. It's not gonna that's be, what's going to happen. It's not going to be because, <laughs> no. uh, it's not going to be because of him, but I, I per, from what I witnessed and also certain parties he was he was very close with the national front uh you know formerly uh, or sorry national yeah. rally formerly national front uh, you know far Marie right Le Pen Le Pen's in france, party right. in, in france and you see in the film you know i get kicked out uh, of uh, of this meeting at the point usually the moment i got kicked out of meetings is when it turned to conversations about money and i mean it felt like he was more of a, not really even just a media consultant, but he was, you know, consulting them about their finances. They like were about banker. to go through their finances. Um, and so I do think he is supporting, and it's not through the movement, it's just him. He is advising at least that party in some capacity. They showed up at the his 2018 election party, uh, you know, or election live stream that he did here in D.C. I mean, the for, f that was the last time that I saw him. So for the 13 months that I witnessed that, that seemed like a genuine relationship. A lot of the other ones were like a few meetings here and there. And then he would try to spin it. A big part of us showing what he's doing in Europe, you know, in the film, we also pair with you know, his efforts to put out the story that he is doing it. And I think that was very important for us. Speaking of relationships, uh, there's this very strange character in your movie, uh, the Chinese, the fugitive Chinese billionaire Miles Kwok. He's like a, uh, like a character out of a, like the evil uh, guy out of an Austin Powers movie yeah. or something. Yeah, Bannon basically, uh, yeah. not evil. Basically. Bannon yeah. has uh, formed this alliance with, um, what is that all about? I mean, uh, I filmed him with uh, Guo Wengui, a.k.a. Miles Kwok, a total of three times. And uh, he, he th during the, the year that I was following him, he spent a lot – He visiting Miles Kwok was, was top priority. I mean, any time he came through town – in New York, that was, you know, the first person he right. would see whenever Kwok was in D.C., he would make sure to see him. Um, from what I – and I can just say from what I've witnessed um, because that that's all, all I really know, um, you know, he – I didn't see any kind of special rapport. I feel like the awkwardness of the scene of them uh, engaging is, you know, partly because the camera's there, but um, really because they have a bit of a language barrier. And I don't think they have, I, I can't imagine what they have to talk about except what, uh, you know, what I show in the film, which is, you know, Miles Kwok's vision of the world and, um, you know, Bannon would like to have his, you know, to, to help guide his money to do things. Well, well I have, they, they share a hatred of the Chinese Communist Party. And one of the things that I thought was interesting about the movie is you see Bannon's almost paranoia about the Chinese talking about how the next mm -hmm. war is going to begin in the South China Sea. He, there's a little bit of an obsession. Which are not totally crazy no, ideas. No, no, there's clearly, genuine but, but, reasons to be concerned about the, uh, China and Chinese government. I mean, Miles Kwok, as I understand it, is trying to expose corruption in the Chinese government, yes, which is rampant. Now he, of it's, course, it's is being accused of out, corruption yeah, he, himself. Not, you know, right. I, I made yeah. a film about a, a uh, an outspoken Chinese dissident named Ai Weiwei, and you know, yeah. I see no equivalency between Miles Kwok and Ai Weiwei. Um, Ai Weiwei, the painter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in the sense that you know, uh, Kwok is trying to fashion himself as a as a sort of whistleblower. He is someone who, you know, is or certainly was a member of the Communist Party, you know, uh, was very close with the Beijing spy master, Wang Jian, uh, who has now fallen out of favor. You know, he's someone who was in until he was out, uh, has made, you know, has become a billionaire as a developer, um, has passports from other countries. I mean, the idea that he is a, like, freedom fighter is complicated because um, part, you know, he has only started to speak out now that he doesn't really have, like, protexia in his and position it, in the government. Right. And is it also the case that Miles Kwok is a, that Bannon sees him as a potential sugar yeah. daddy? I yeah, mean, I mean he, sets up line, he sets up a $100 yeah, million yeah, dollar fund, the rule of law fund, and turns it over to Bannon to uh, to manage. Right? Yes. I mean, bottom line, is is, is Miles Kwok bankrolling Bannon? Uh, 
he, so the end of the film, they they did a press conference that was right after the midterms where they announced that he is going to have, like you said, this $100 million fund um, that Bannon is going to manage, and they're calling it the rule of law fund. Um, but, you know, he we rode on Miles Glock's plane through, you know, right. many of those mm-hmm. scenes. Sometimes he was leasing planes. Sometimes he, we were riding on his. I don't know the financial arrangement behind that, but... Um, you know, it seemed to me like the amount of time he was spending with Clock seemed significant. And I don't have, you know, answers beyond what I what I saw. So um, this movie does show all sides of Steve Bannon. We are talking about the truly dangerous sides. Um, but, you know, you also see the charismatic side, the learned side, the engaging side, the relationships he has with reporters um what's been his reaction to the film uh i just can i just i just want to add to that quickly i think it it was very important for us to show those sides to him because i think that uh the way he was being depicted and the way people thought of him including many people i know is that you know more in the sort of dick cheney crawl rove somber dark and actually i think a lot of his um power personal power and influence actually comes from the fact that he's actually a deeply charismatic quite enjoyable, entertaining, charming man. Does that make him more dangerous? I think it makes him more normal in the sense that it means that anyone, you know, it's not, I I always say this thing that just someone who does bad things isn't necessarily breathing fire 24 Mm -hmm. hours a day. Um, To answer your question, uh, he saw the, yes, I screened the film for him. Uh, He saw the, 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 basically the finished version of the film. I think it was a very Strange thing for him to watch, uh, if, as it would be for anyone, a verite portrait when someone's been following you for a year. So he was very quiet, I would say, throughout the film. Um, kind of whether that was because he was, it was it was challenging to watch, or because he was trying to actually kind of you know uh, keep his cards close to his vest. Um, you know, uh, he has. I, I was in touch with him very often uh, after that. In, through Sundance and um, you know when all I know is that when the reviews came out he stopped talking to me completely and stopped returning my emails or my text messages so I you know I can only extrapolate from that um, but that's as much as I know well Wait. I should I should point out that I did invite him through his spokesperson Alexandria Priya to call in uh, to the podcast while you folks were on and uh, apparently uh, he was he's he's busy today on a rally to build the wall, mm-hmm. a build the wall rally. Um, but we hope to have him on Skull but we, but we do but hope to have him on. He has an open invitation. Um, just in 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 wrapping up here, um, g- give us both of you your your best sense of what's next for Steve Bannon because he's uh, you know kind of been cast out of the White House. Um, any chance he'll come back to run the campaign in, in or work on the campaign in 2020? Uh, does he – are there other aspirations that he might have? And I guess the bottom line question is, is he uh, just kind of tapping into this particular moment in our politics and culture, the populism, you know, the nationalism, all these issues? Or is he a force uh, in our politics for a long time to come? Uh, you know, the film... We could probably answer co- in a complimentary way. <laughs> yeah, totally. I feel like the film is called The Brink, and I think part of the reason it's a good title is that, um, you know, he is a a figure that thrives at the brink, and he seems to be able to uh, keep reinventing himself. Uh, whether that means, you know, I, I think that that means, and, and you see in the way we end the film, you know, it's not like he has been vanquished. Um, I think he's going to, you know, keep trying to find that money, find that power, find that p- place that he has significance until the end. Like, I don't see any reason why he's going to stop. Um, but I, I I don't necessarily think of him as someone who is, um, is leading the way. And I think that, uh, I think that it, a lot of the answer to that question is going to depend on other people. It's going to depend, does Trump want him back? I mean, that's kind of more up to Trump. Um, does... Does he continue to be a force? Well, does our society keep making room for someone like mm-hmm. him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I think that um, I don't think that you know, speaking for myself, I would have wanted to make the film if I thought that he was someone who was just going to end up, you know, in the dustbin like in three months. I because then I just think then it becomes just a 
purely historic piece, and I actually do think that he's, you know, if if he has one very notable strength is I do think he has a, like a kind of intelligence about political um, forces and 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 political forces that are shaping the fu- the, the the near future. I think he kind of saw the the strength of the Tea Party very early and jumped on board that. People like Sarah Palin. I remember fighting with him about Sarah Palin and. Uh, you know, he saw that at the beginning. So I don't want to, you know, I think it's not, it would be um, foolish to kind of count him out. I don't know if he is personally going to be a force, like as a politician. I, I don't see that. But I, you know, I think, but look, the there's, a lot, of, there's that a lot of he, unscrupulous that he has people. Mobilized yes. And there's also a lot of people with without yeah. scruples in the political arena who I think would be very happy to pay him to advise them, not just Republicans. Um, so I think yeah, in terms of I, him being, you know, people, wanting to tap into what they perceive as his knowledge or his actual knowledge, I don't think that's going to go away. That's such a good point, too, me saying is there room and does society have want to make room for someone like him? But it's also do billionaires want to keep funding him? And politicians yeah. want to keep using him. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, him oxygen. You know, he I talks mean, to I really a lot think of that big... needs to be, you know, I can't, like, say that enough. The film is verite, so it's observational, but I feel like there's a lot of things that are put in there very intentionally, and I think to just talk about him and his persona is – like would be a disappointment to us, you know, as as fascinating as we think he is as a figure. And like Marie Therese said, you know, is important, not just the, you know, yesterday, as the BBC asked us, is he yesterday's man, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think the question of why he's been able to thrive isn't just about him and it is about who is funding him. And, I and think, who's covering him in, yeah, in the news. And I and... think that that should be, I would love to see journalists talking about that a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, well, who's funding him and and who who we are as a society yes, exactly. because he's obviously tapped into real sentiments uh, that are still with us. Um, the he, film is The Brink and it will be in theaters when? March 29th. March 29th. Okay. Everybody should go see it. It's a fascinating uh, movie, extremely well done. We didn't get, really get a chance to talk about technique, but uh, Next time. Very Tay. I like saying that. All right. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And while Bannon tries to energize Trump's base, the Democratic field keeps getting larger. And uh, this week, all the talk is Betomania. Okay. So I got to say, Trump also um, reacted to Betomania on the day that uh, Beto announced his candidacy. He was... Uh, asked by reporters his reaction. And I just got to read you what Trump said. And and before doing that, just make the point that Bannon, um, in this movie that we are uh, t- that we talked about, called him a transformative president who we'll be talking about for uh, a, a very long time. This is how that transformative president reacted to the announcement that Beto uh, O'Rourke is running for president. Let me read this here. I think he's got a lot of hand movement. <laughs> I've never seen so much hand movement, Trump told reporters at the White House. And I said, is he crazy or is that just the way he acts? I've actually never seen anything quite like it. Study it. I'm sure you'll agree. (laughs) Transformative in some sense, but I'm not sure in the sense that Bannon was thinking. Is he crazy? (laughs) A question that will loom large in this uh, presidential race. All right. We've got a great guest to talk about it. We now have on the line, uh, calling in from Austin, Texas, the dean of Texas political consultants, George Shipley. George, welcome to Skullduggery. Thank you for having me. So um, a lot of excitement this week over the entry of Beto O'Rourke into the uh, Democratic uh, primary contest. you uh, you know Beto O'Rourke. Uh, is the Democratic Party going to fall for Beto mania? Well, he's going to cause a lot of excitement. Uh, Beto is a uh, Homeric character uh, in, uh, on a grand adventure in his own mind. He's uh, sailing that wine dark sea, and he's <laughs> going to bring lots of excitement, lots of uh, lots of passion to the race, uh, and he's going to excite. Uh, if the Texas experience is any uh, any guide, he's going to excite younger voters, and he's going to he's he's an idealist and uh, and he's going to bring just a lot of energy to the race. It's going to be very interesting to see 
how he fares out in Iowa. I, I, I'm detecting just a little bit of a sense you might have that uh, the Beto phenomenon is uh, has been a little hyped. Um, wh- where do you think he fits into this uh, uh, very large and growing field of Democratic candidates? Well, Beto is is fundamentally to the center of these candidates, and and although I think that the, the uh, in the left in the left space, I think the some of the candidates will feel somewhat crowded, but but Beto's voting record in the House and uh, and his is but would place him closer to someone like uh, Biden should Biden get in. Uh, Beto has uh, friendly relations, for example, with the uh, uh, and has accepted contributions in the past from the oil and gas industry, and uh, has uh, has been uh, uh, probably compared to many of these candidates. I think he's more business oriented than some of them. He also so we'll see. he also refu- <laughs> refused to endorse a uh, Democratic uh, House uh, candidate in a Texas race uh, this last time around because he wanted to support his friend, Congressman Hurd, uh, the Republican. Is that going to uh, be a problem for him? Yes, in the primaries, uh, it's a uh, the, pro- the, the Democratic prim- presidential primaries are, uh, as you guys know, is a is a free for all, and the, his support of of, of Hurd, of Will Hurd, I think, will be an issue. Uh, he supported Hurd over a Latino uh, a feminist candidate, who was uh, very uh, strongly supported uh, by the DCCC and and other Democrats here. That will be an issue. Now, you, George, are uh, uh, famous as uh, one of the great uh, oppo guys in in, in American politics, uh, uh, sensing the weakness of of, of rival candidates and figuring out ways to exploit it. So I I was struck in just doing a little research on, on Beto that he was once a member of a punk band called Foss, which put out a record called the El Paso, El Paso Pussycats, in which he's on the cover uh, wearing a dress. Now, it seems to me uh, in the, uh, the, the, the Trump world, we'll take note of this, and that's the kind of thing they could use against him. Uh, possibly. The, the, the Cruz people surfaced that in, the, in his Senate campaign. And uh, I'm sure we'll see it on the cover of the National Enquirer if there's still a National Enquirer next year, and uh, and and I'm sure that the uh, the, the the conservative the, the Republicans see him as a very formidable candidate, uh, and I think that's why the Club for Growth and others have singled him out for attacks uh, in Iowa. So uh, uh, yes, uh, Beto does have that in the Democratic primary, of course, being the lead singer in a rock in a, in a, in a a punk band is probably a plus. Yeah. Well, George, um, th- there may be a slightly more serious uh, issue for him in terms of opposition research, uh, and that is that I think in 1998 he was arrested for driving uh, while intoxicated, um, and he's talked about this. He disclosed it, I think, in his first race. There, there has been some uh, accusation, which he's denied, uh, that he left the scene of of, of the accident. Um, what do you know about that, um, and do you think that's uh, potentially a problem for him down the road? Um, it's old news, and I'm sure that his opponents will dredge it up, and he'll have ample time to explain it again. Uh, it's been covered by, uh, I think, the Times and other uh, other national publications in the Senate race. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the issue evolves about whether or not his explanations for leaving the scene were adequate, and and he'll have ample time, I'm sure, to uh, to revisit it in the course of the campaign. He should do that. And he probably will do that. He should do it on the front end of what he does. Of yeah, his, uh, it, it does occur to me that sort of post Kavanaugh that that's a kind of uh, accusation or revel- revelation, although it's it's been out there before. That could have some traction. I mean, people, the Democrats made a lot of Brett Kavanaugh's drinking uh, while in high school and college. Uh, when this happened with Beto, it was uh, he was what in his twenties, um, uh, past college, and it was a DWI and a leaving the scene of the accident. Well, he's going to have ample time to explain it, and and uh, as the scrutiny phase of the campaigns uh, escalates uh, later this summer, I'm sure that uh, that he'll be asked uh, uh, about that issue, and he'll and uh, in in the clarity of his explanations will determine. Uh, uh, what the voters make of it. So how do you assess the uh, Democratic field right now? It is um, 
extremely crowded. Um, we have Biden seemingly on the brink of uh, jumping in. Uh, you know, early polls show, you know, Biden and Sanders uh, right at the top in Iowa. Um, what's your um, what's your keen political sense tell you right now? Well, we're going to have a good, healthy primary season. And, and I learned a long time ago never to predict presidential primaries. But on the surface, it would appear that uh, that uh, Biden uh, is certainly uh, in a in a great position uh, if he can capitalize on his experience and on his uh, uh, strength within the party structure. Uh, Biden has a history of gaffing in, in previous races, and uh, and he's got to demonstrate that he is uh, strong and able to really uh, to uh, uh, articulate a, a clear message uh, without uh, without the gaffes. But I see, I see the race really is, is Biden and Bernie and Harris at this point, with Beto coming up. Uh, well, Beto will create an enormous amount of excitement on the front end. Whether he can capitalize on it is another question. Uh, one more question on, on, on the sure. Democratic primary, and then I'm going to get back to Beto for a second. But for the, for the general election, um, is it, do you think it's uh, more of an advantage to be a centrist Democrat along the lines of a Biden or potentially a Beto? Um, or uh, is there so much energy uh, in, the, in the Democratic electorate um, that you really need to be more to the left? Uh, I don't know. I think the voters are going to make that decision for us. Uh, uh, personally, I would, I would be a more centrist. I would prefer a more centrist candidate. But I think we're going to see what happens. But the, the Democrats want to win this year. The, the underlying issue is the replacement of Donald Trump. And, 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 and I think the Democrats will, will submerge some of their issue differences uh, uh, in that quest to, uh, to, uh, to get the vote out uh, across the nation to defeat Donald Trump. But look, there are a lot of um, Democrats who are worried that uh, between uh, talk of Medicare for all and the Green New Deal and reparations, that the party really is veering off to the left in a serious way. And that, uh, you know, I get that that's where the progressive energy is in the Democratic base, but it does make uh, uh, it does complicate uh, the party's chances in a general election. And, you know, you being in Texas would know that better than anybody. Well, sure. But I think I think there's a consensus among among all the Democratic candidates broadly that we've got to we've got to do some very forceful things with regard to health care, uh, whether you call it uh, a Medicare buy in or single payer, uh, whatever. We've got to do things on pre-existing conditions. The issue is unresolved. It's in the courts. We have to do things on drug prices and on, the, on gouging by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we've got to make health care more accessible to larger portions of the population. So, so how that works itself out uh, in the course of the campaign, we'll see. The, the, the current immediate debate between socialism and capitalism is kind of an artificial um, uh, one to me. I don't think the voters are really interested in, uh, in going to school. What they want to do is appraise these candidates and see who is stronger and more vigorous and who is more passionate and clear uh, in their uh, in their efforts, and who would be the strongest candidate to lead the fight uh, in 2020? I don't want to put you on the spot, George, but uh, tell us and our listeners what you think uh, uh, Beto's greatest strength is, or strengths are, and uh, greatest uh, vulnerabilities going forward in this. Uh, well, campaign. He, he brings. Uh, he's passionate. He's energetic. Uh, he brings a, a sense of uh, epic purpose, which creates a cause, which is going to attract a lot of non. If, if, if history is a guide, uh, attract non-involved younger voters to the primary scene. On the on the other side of that coin, the presidential league is a is a is a, is a tough one, where candidates the, the voters expect candidates to be substantive, to say exactly what they mean, and to not. Uh, re, uh, recycle uh, uh, bromides and platitudes and so on. So Beto has a burden to make his case and describe exactly what differentiates him from the others. Uh, where is he? he? He talked this morning in his announcement about the uh, 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 environment and about uh, uh, clean energy and so forth and about the, uh, the Green New Deal. 
But what does that mean for a candidate from an energy state? What does that mean with regard to the fossil fuels industry, to fracking, et cetera, et cetera? I think the Democrats are going to want to know those answers, and I think they're going to want to know them very clearly. And, and, and the same thing is true with regard to health and, uh, and other issues as well. And I think all of them have a requirement to talk specifically about taxes and to sort of engage in a conversation that's sort of been uh, Elizabeth Warren's area with regard to the regulation of financial instruments and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and, and, and Beto, has to, Beto has to move from the passion to a clear uh, uh, articulation of those differentiating characteristics. So he's got a burden, and that first debate in June is going to is going to is going to set the stage. He did not do well in the debates against Ted Cruz, and uh, and so he's got a, a, an expectation problem uh, right off the bat. He also has another expectation problem in that he's really got to do well in Iowa. I don't think that he is viable if he simply comes in third in Iowa and makes some sort of an adequate show. He's got well, to win isn't that, isn't that Isn't that some, an advantage that he actually has? Because, uh, you know, he, he is – I haven't seen him up close, but he's supposed to be a good retail politician. This is someone who actually made it to every precinct in, in, uh, in Texas, I think, over the course of his uh, challenge to Ted Cruz. And, you know, Iowa and New Hampshire are all about retail politics and getting close to people and voters. Well, it's, it's a horse of another color. He is a good retail politician, but so is Kamala Harris and so is Bernie Sanders, for that matter. And so is Klobuchar if she gets, if she gets moving a little bit. So I, I, and, and, and so is Biden when he wants to be. So if the competition is a lot tougher than Beto faced before and, and, and the uh, Iowa voters are accustomed – to seeing all these candidates, and and uh, and to uh, seeing them on multiple occasions, so so the the other test in Iowa, besides the excitement, is can you leave and can you create and leave an organization in place, and that's a new te- that'd be a test for Beto as well. Why didn't he do well in the debates in, in against Cruz? I don't know. I suspect it was a, frankly a lack of preparation. Plus the fact that that. Cruz himself is a pretty skilled debater. I well, think yes, he was of like course. the champion. Right. Cruz yeah, is, that, a, is a very, very formidable right. uh, debater. Uh, uh, in the in the first debate, Cruz uh, manipulated the dialogue quite quite ably. I think in some um, ways. And, and we'll see whether Beto learned from that experience or not. Okay, last question, George. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this podcast uh, talking about the Russia investigation, and the uh, in fact, our subtitle of Skullduggery is "Scandals of the Trump Era." Um, how much has all this hurt Donald Trump, uh, and do you think it's going to carry over to the 2020 race? Yes. I think that the uh, America is waiting to see the Mueller report, the evidence of uh, cooperation between the Trump campaign, certainly, and, uh, and the Russian state and the Kremlin is mounting. The publicly available evidence uh, shows a uh, certainly suggests an indication of, uh, of, of of cooperation. I think that that issue is going to overshadow uh, by next year, certainly, the election. I think that the, uh, the, the American people have, are deciding what to do about it. And they've not reached that decision yet, but but I think the next six to eight months will be pivotal for, for Donald Trump. Is, is it really cutting with voters, do you think? Not yet, but it will. Well, uh, you know, are you not at all worried that Democrats could be overplaying their hand right now and that if Mueller doesn't come up with the real wallop, the smoking gun, that, um, you know, this this could fade and you'll have a lot of Democrats out there who have, uh, you know, made some very strong statements uh, about Trump and and, 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 and and Trump will just be yeah. emboldened and uh, run against the witch hunt that didn't turn anything up. I don't. I don't accept that. I think you, you don't have to look only to Manafort sentence and to the indictment of the Russians and to the indictment of the Americans to uh, uh, to suggest that there were uh, things going on. There's the uh, unresolved issues around Trump Tower, uh, unresolved issues around Trump's method of financing uh, with regard to the Deutsche Bank uh, issues, and so on. So, so I, I don't. I don't accept that at all. I think that there is such. The, the, the problem, the communications problem, is that there is such a wealth of, 
of uh, unseemly material, of scandalous material, that it's hard to get your arms around it. <laughs> well, and, and, um, that's what we try to do. That, that's what we are every dedicated to doing. Skullduggery. Do. Skullduggery. <laughs> right. Uh, that's what you guys do. I know. I think it's. I think that, that it is the. Uh, pardon the pardon the pun. It's the elephant in the room. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I think it will be on the conversations of Americans, uh, uh, certainly in the latter part of this year and through the election. Yeah. I think Americans want to know who he's working for, the United States or the Kremlin. Right. Um, well, uh, George, thanks for uh, joining us on Skullduggery, and we will be checking in as the uh, Democratic race goes on to get your um, always valuable insights. It's always a pleasure. Thank you both. Okay. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, George. Thanks to Allison Clayman and Marie Therese Girgis from the film The Brink, as well as George Shipley for joining us on this episode of Skullduggery. Don't forget to subscribe to Skullduggery on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And tell us what you think. Leave a review. The latest episode is also on SiriusXM on the weekend. Check it out on POTUS Channel 124 on Saturdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, with replays on Sundays at 1 a.m. and 3 p.m. Be sure to follow us on social media at Skullduggery Pod. And now you can watch the podcast on yahoonews.com, YouTube, and Roku, Saturdays and Mondays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Talk to you soon.